Hello, my name is Amelia Wilbur, and I'll be presenting today's webinar, Tomatoes, Planting, and Cultural Best Practices. I'm joined today by two other master gardeners, Sean Van Doren and Sherry Hawley. Sean will be uh, monitoring the chat box and uh, be putting in some links and information for you during the presentation. Sherry Hawley will be monitoring the Q&A box. You will have to put some questions in there for us. We'll try to answer them at the end of the session. Sherry's an experienced tomato grower and taught many classes herself, so I appreciate her joining me. The noontime chat today is part of and a feature of the 10 Minute University, which is done in collaboration with and support of the OSU, that's Oregon State University Extension Service Master Gardener Program. As mentioned previously, the session is being recorded and will be available for you to view in a few days, and you should get a link telling you how to access that video. Today's webinar is the third and final in a series of addressing growing our own tomatoes in your garden. Some of you may have watched earlier when we talked about the benefits of growing tomatoes from seed, or perhaps you've just recently purchased a start from the nursery or a garden store. Regardless, you probably have a seed start a plant that's ready to go in the garden. Um, it's been a little cool and wet here in the Willamette Valley, and there's many of us that haven't put our gardens, uh, tomato plants in yet the garden. Some of you may have already. Regardless, we're going to try and talk through uh, the season all up to a harvest to, in our session today to help you have a successful and productive uh, bunch of tomatoes that you're gonna be enjoying and be very proud of. The tomato has been called America's favorite vegetable, and I suppose a lot of it's because it's so versatile. There's so tremendous number of varieties, uh, well over a thousand, and you can use it in so many different ways, and it's so tasty, much better than what you get out of the grocery store. But, you know, the tomato actually is historically a descendant of a weed that originated in Peru, and, you know, we don't have to work too hard to grow weeds. I don't have to work at that, but the tomato uh, through the years as it's been cultivated and developed is a, is a plant that needs a lot of care and TLC and uh, watching and care. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today is how that you're gonna care for that tomato plant to get it through a successful season. Uh, the tomato is, as it is now, you know, a little prone to disease and challenges, and we'll talk about those so that you will uh, be able to manage those. There's a lot to be covered on, so we're going to uh, talk about the objectives and uh, help you get through to the harvest season. First of all, we'll talk about when to plant the tomato start in the garden and do a quick review about how to do that in case you haven't. Then we'll talk about the best ways to support a large tomato plant, how to manage your plant for better health and better fruit, how to prune, water, and fertilize your plant. And those three topics sometimes are the most important in helping to get your uh, crop to a good harvest. So we'll talk about those. How to identify and manage tomato diseases and disorder, disorders. Now, there's, we're only going to touch briefly into that to help you start to recognize how to watch for those and also where to get some help when you see that. And how best to meet the weather challenges, environmental problems, and insect pests. And finally, how do I maximize the production and get an early harvest? So let's get started. Well, as I said, we haven't put our garden, our tomatoes in yet because the soil's not warm enough and the air's too cool. But when you've got your soil in good workable conditions, and that means it's not wet and heavy from still from the winter, uh, and the danger of frost is passed, and the nighttime temperatures are uh, 50 degrees or a little warmer, Hopefully your soil is warmed up to 60 degrees. And for us in Western Oregon this year, it's gonna be the middle to end of May for many of us. So it is a late spring. And of course you remember from the earlier class, if you've got a plant that's you either got from the nursery, it's been in a nice uh, 
climate inside the, the greenhouses or, or in your house, that plant is not ready to go just immediately out into the garden. You need to harden it off. So you're going to acclimate it to outside temperatures and weather, exposing it a little bit at a time over 10 to 14 days and get it so that it won't be quite such a shock to go in the garden. Then you're going to put it into the garden. Soil is 60 degrees, the plant's hardened off, and then you have to decide how you're going to put it in, trench or vertical. Be sure you've hydrate, hydrated the plant first, and you need to space the plants. And we'll talk further on in the uh, program about the need for uh, space between plants. So plan uh, four to five feet distance for the rows and at least two to three feet for each plant. So different ways to plant, trench, uh, you can plant usually earlier in the season because you're going to put it not so deep in the soil, so the soil would be warmer uh, closer to the surface. Uh, so the plant would grow quickly in that. The, the uh, thing we have to watch out for is that the roots can dry out faster because it is so close to the surface. The other system is the vertical system. If you put it in early in the season, there's uh, soil around the roots that's it's deeper, so there it's colder and it'll slow the growth. You won't see it take off right away as you would with the trench. But in the summer, it's more protected as far as hydration because the uh, roots are deeper and have more water to draw in. One thing to remember, if you are a person who has purchased a grafted tomato plant, do not plant it deep uh, or you will lose the benefit of the, uh, the graft, which is really right above the soil surface from where you bought it. So let's just look at the, what it looks like. Here's a vertical planting. Dig a hole 10 to 12 inches deep, plant to that depth and remove the leaves that are close to the uh, uh, soil, five to six inches, take the leaves off. With the trench, uh, again, it's an easier place to put, to put it in earlier. And it looks like this, you're gonna dig the hole six to eight inches deep, re again, remove the lower leaves and lay the plant on its side. It can be a little bit of a challenge uh, for planting a taller plant, and this might be able to meet that challenge, but you do need to be careful as you do how to stake it because you'll see it needs to change the angle. If you work with it carefully, it'll work fine. I want you to look at this stem because if you plant that deep, all of the little hairs on this stem are now going to become roots, and that means a healthy plant when you have a strong root system. Just a brief review for the other classes. Tomatoes are one of the plants that have an adventitious roots. And so any other thing that any part of the stem that was exposed to soil will, will grow roots. Here you can see where the plant was laid a little bit on its side and how many roots have been produced. Again, that portends a very uh, good start to having a healthy plant. Well, so then the second objective was how to support your plant. And it's very, very important. Although the tomato can, is a vine, it is a vine that will not uh, do anything but lay on the ground unless you uh, train it to, to be upright. And so you've got to stake it. You can see this farmer's got a lot of options here. There's cages and fences and wooden stakes and poles. The key here, regardless of what you use, is sturdy. You look over here to this, to this um, is a purchased tomato cage, which will work pretty good until the tomato got quite tall. And then the farmer had to put in some more wooden stakes to support, excuse me, to support the, the, the keep the cage from tipping over. I've had cages tumble over when the tomatoes grow so high, so tie and high and then have a lot of tomatoes on it. So again, the key word, sturdy. Doesn't matter what you use, it's gotta be sturdy though. So why do you have to stake it? Well, you can uh, avoid uh, crowded plants. You can see even though these were planted quite a distance apart, how they have grown so much that they're close together. So you want to uh, save space in your garden. You want to be able to have your plant have a lot of sunlight. Sunlight comes in, hits the leaves. The leaves produce through photosynthesis, the sugar, the sugar which goes into your uh, fruit and you get bigger, sweeter, and earlier fruit. So staking the plant is a very smart way to go to get that sunlight and air into it. Well, it also is just healthier. You can see that these plants, this uh, vine has just been allowed to lay on the ground. With that, they're susceptible to uh, disease and pests that can climb up either from soil-borne diseases or pests that can just access your plant. So keep it up off the ground and stake it to be a, make it healthier. 
So let's talk about ways to support it. Um, when I put the cage around, I also have a stake and the stake is put at the time uh, of planting near the plant. And you can see that I've, it's been tied with something with a, like a soft tie. You don't wanna use wire, but a cloth or anything that's, that has some flexibility and then wind it around the stem to keep it close to the stake. Lots of ways to support the plants. Be creative. You can use uh, make a ladder out of it, um, a trellis. You can see where there's cages. Now it's important to see how deep those cages have been shown in the drawing to be sent in, put into the earth so they're very sturdy. So cage or rods, espalier or a, a tripod. Lots of ways, just again, make it sturdy. Here's a good one to do. Uh, uh, quite often people will use um, hog fence and build a cage, square cage. The nice thing about it is it can be collapsed in the winter for storage, so it's a little easier. And that's a very sturdy cage. Uh, this is a system we've developed for our garden with using PVC pipe. And you can see we've used elbows there that to make for joints and uh, placed it deep. This was in a um, cloth bag, but it goes deep and it's a very sturdy one. We've got a center structure for the stake and the PVC pipe works very well. Again, the important thing is it needs to be sturdy. We know the what, any structure that will support the plant upright until harvest and the how is sturdy. So now you say, okay, when do I need to have the stake on? And the answer is put the stake in the cage when you plant it. If you put your plants in this next weekend, but haven't got the cages and say, oh, I'll get them next week. When you come back to put that in, if that plant has had some warm weather, it's going to take off and grow. And by the time you put the cage in, you may actually damage the roots by pushing that cage down into the earth. So do it when you plant the plant. Now, we talked about some of the things that uh, are always a question for uh, growers. How do and when do I water my tomatoes? Uh, you've probably heard it's very important to keep the uh, water at the soil to surface down into the roots. So drip irrigation, use soaker hoses or spritzers, or there's a lots of creative ways to provide water going right down into the tomato, uh, into the soil. Avoid getting water on the fruit and the foliage as that can cause um, increased risk of diseases. It's important to maintain a uniform moisture level. Some of the diseases and situations we see with tomatoes are because it's not been consistent. So soak thoroughly once, once every seven to 10 days. It doesn't mean soak every day, seven to 10 times. It means soak it once every seven to 10 days, depending on your soil and of course the temperature and the part of the summer you're in. Inconsistent watering or irrigation leads to fruit cracking, or blossom and rot. And when we talk, get further into the program, we'll talk about diseases we can, uh, and issues, we can talk about that further. But it's very important that you water deeply. Uh, you planted it deep, the roots are deep, and now water it deep. When you can do that, the roots can build a strong system. And then of course, you can see this uh, garden has been mulched well with some straw or some hay. Uh, we use a plastic mulch to cover a red plastic, or uh, sometimes seems to, promote the ripening of the tomatoes, but it's something that mulches the soil so that you reduce the evaporation of water from the soil. Watering schedule, one inch of water per week per plant. Now that's maybe a little hard to estimate. Um, it's been tested in that one inch covering a, a five foot square plot where the tomato would be, would be about three gallons. So you can kind of see, set your timer to see how long it takes you to fill up three gallons with whatever you're um, watering your spritzer or whatever your soakers are and provide that for a, a, each week once. Steady, consistent throughout the summer until the beginning of August. Now, again, it depends on your soil. You'll see there loamy soil, probably once a week. Sandy soil where the water is gonna drain out four to six days. If you have a lot of clay, it'll hold the water more and hold moisture and maybe you can get by with every 10 days. One thing we'll talk about that's very important is to decrease the watering as the fruit ripens. If you stop watering and stress the plant, it will hasten the ripening. Now look at these tomatoes. This is kind of sad. If I'm going to continue to water a lot and my, my regular schedule that I had all summer, and I keep doing it when the tomatoes are starting to ripen, 
that water goes up through the plant and goes into the tomato and splits the skin. The skin is a, is a constant that was already set up. And if you add a lot of water, there's no place for the water to go except to split the skin. So rainwater also, when, when it rains, can cause it, it comes absorbed into the tomato fruit. But uh, watering during ripening times, you'll end up with some split fruit. So that's another reason to stop watering and reduce it. Now the concept of fertilizing. Tomatoes are heavy feeders. You need to be sure that you're giving them what they need for nutrition to stay healthy and grow. You're gonna see here, uh, Oregon State University recommends a ratio of one to two to one of the following nitrogen, which is the first, phosphorus, which is the second middle number, and potassium, which is the end number. Now, this is a ratio. You may see it in 363 three, or 510, five, 5, but it is this ratio. And the reason we want that is that nitrogen produces a lot of foliage and green leaves, but you're not growing a tomato for that. You're growing it for the fruit. And so this higher phosphorus level will give you an abundance of the flowers and fruit. And hopefully by your planting, you've already got nice roots and tubers, uh, roots that are growing on that plant, not tubers. Okay, fertilizing. Ideally, you had a chance to do some compost into the soil before we were talking about ready to plant. But at planting time, add a handful, one to two ounces of this fertilizer and some bone meal to each planting hole. And then, are you through? No, nope. when the fruit is set, that is when the pollination is completed, put on a side dressing of two to three tablespoons around the drip line of the plant. Now, how do you side dress? You're gonna pull back the mulch from the base of the plant, work the fertilizer into the soil, not too deep, don't dig too deep, and rewater again, and then replace the mulch. Then you're gonna to continue to fertilize, again, that one to one ratio, every three to four weeks. Be sure to avoid high nitrogen fertilizer. It's gonna cause the plant to grow, just green, and it'll not fruit, and it can cause blossom end rot with too much nitrogen. So summarizing fertilizing. One month before planting, try to have the compost at planting, handful of one to two to one into the soil. When the fruit is set or the pollination complete, continue to fertilize with that same fertilizer. And then month later, again, with the same. Again, it is a low nitrogen fertilizer. So that's your fertilizing schedule. Now, the third item of that uh, was, was fertilizer water and now pruning. So why do we have to prune? Well, you can see here, the plant is just gonna go uh, way beyond what you ever thought. These are, we thought were nice wooden structures, cages. And yet even as the season grew, they start to fall over. We've had to brace it here on the outside. So you need to control the growth of your plant. A tomato can grow to 10, 12 feet and can grow sideways five, six, eight feet. So you've got to control that. you want to prune it. Also, remember we talked about getting sunlight in there. You want to let air and light get to the center of the plant. And that's where you have to kind of reach in through the cage and clean out the center there uh, so that it light can get into it. If you'll prune, you can get more larger fruits, not more, but usually larger. If you don't do any, you're gonna have, you can have a lot of small fruits, but if you wanna try and have some nice big tomatoes, try to do some pruning. Uh, this particular uh, tomato is a big sack and it was pruned specifically to see uh, how, how big it can get. And that's a pretty nice sized tomato. Also, it's gonna be easier when your tomatoes are ripe to, for your family to get in and pick them. So prune so that you don't have this forest that people can't even see the tomatoes. You wanna be able to make it easy for them to pick and enjoy. Which plants are you gonna prune? Well, definitely the indeterminates. You know, the indeterminates are a vine and that they will just grow and grow. Pruning is strongly advised. If you let it just grow too many vines, uh, then the plant's energy is focused on growing more vines and not fruit production. And uh, pruning makes it, uh, the plant more, uh, look better in your garden as well. Now, some of you grow determinants. Um, these are ones that are often grown in a pot on your patio or even in the garden. Remember the determinants produce all at once uh, within a period of two to three weeks so that you have a nice crop to processor can, but you don't want to do a lot of pruning of the determinants because the fruit is produced on the ends of the branches. You can see here, and if you're going to prune those, you're going to end up 
reducing the amount of fruit you're going to get. So very little, uh, maybe mostly to, sh to shape it or keep it so it's manageable size, but try not to avoid uh, pruning the branches too much. Let's look at uh, understand the structure of a plant. We have the stem that's growing up and from it we have the lateral branches. And then we have the flower clusters and up top you see the growing tip of the plant. You also see something here called a sucker and that's growing in between the stem and the lateral branch. And these suckers can be a problem and we'll talk about how you manage pruning with those. When to prune? Well, you've plant the, put the plant in and it's already grown to about a foot or foot and a half. Start thinking about pruning it then. And you'll want to do it probably on a weekly basis to manage the, uh, the new growth and the suckers to keep from uh, having it just get to be too much. You'll also want to be monitoring it for any broken or diseased stems or branches when they appear. So be sure and take those off. Here's a, a, a suggestion too, that when you've got the plant in and you're starting to see some fruiting, there's the first blossoms, take off the branches below that. They will not be needed for uh, uh, production. Now you've got the growth up here and the photosynthesis, and these are likely to start falling down onto the ground and causing disease. So um, take off the, the uh, branches below the first uh, blossoms. Now, if you want to try to organize your tomato plant so it really produces well, and uh, I recommend that you start looking at a, at a stem for either a single liter or two liters. Sometimes people have three, but well, however you organize it, make sure that you are supporting it as it's growing and training it. Again, it's a vine that will not, will not uh, wind and trust, trellis by itself. It needs constant training. Now, pruning, depending on what your focus is and your purpose, there are four types of pruning. There's simple pruning, Missouri type or style, root pruning, and topping. So let's talk about each one. Again, it's what you want to accomplish. So here, young in the, plants, the plant's fairly young, and we're starting to see these suckers develop. Some of my ones that are still in the greenhouse and not in the ground are already having suckers growing. So I've been removing those, but they are they need to be removed so that the energy goes to the stem and not these non-productive uh, growths. Also, uh, you wanna minimize any of the stress and breakage on the stem. Simple pruning involves the sucker that grows between the stem and the lateral branch. Then there's Missouri pruning, and that's for those of us who go on vacation and are gone for two weeks and come back and are overwhelmed with what that plant looks like, and we can't even identify the suckers from the lateral. Sometimes they get to be just as big. You don't want to go in and take it off like you would a small sucker, because you can look at here, you're going to have a large wound right next to that stem, which is susceptible then to disease. So the Missouri style pruning says take off just part of it so that you're reducing the risk of the, uh, of the sucker depleting the energies of the plant and the, it won't stress it as much, but you've avoided creating this large wound. So that's a, a, a type of uh, pruning to manage the plant. Now there's the next two types of pruning are really to uh, not manage the plant, but to try and hasten harvesting. So this is done and I wanna stress a small area of roots at the end of the season. This is where you can take something like a knife or a sharp uh, point and drive it down to just not near the end, not near the main part of the roots, but off to the edge. And it's toward the end of the season, you drive it down just one section and that will hasten ripening because it stresses the plant. The tomato plant wants to grow and grow and grow. And when it can't grow, then it says, I need to ripen these fruits. And so that's what you want it to do. In order to have green tomatoes still in September, you can try to uh, hasten it with some root pruning. Another way to do it is to top the uh, top of the plant. So you're going to remove growth that's oh, at the top of the cage or five to six, six feet. So up here, you're going to take that off. You still see some blossoms there. But if it's late enough in the season, you would maybe even say that's not going to develop into, into tomatoes. So take those two. But what you're trying to do is stop the growth and hasten the ripening. So four different types of pruning. Things to think about in pruning, 
Again, look at, see if you can't create main stems that you can train to support and don't let the plant go beyond the cage. It's just going to uh, be falling down and, and be in the way, make it hard to go through the, uh, uh, your garden. Prune the stems beyond the cage. Be sure you remove the suckers. And there's a good example. There's a picture of a sucker. Now I find it's a good test for my hydration of my plant. If I can go out with my finger and snip that off and it breaks off nice and clean and crisp, I know my plant's well hydrated. But if I go out trying to get some suckers off and it just kind of bends wilty and I have a hard time getting it off, I have to say I'm not hydrating that plant enough and perhaps I'm not, I'm not gonna increase the number of waterings, but I'm gonna increase the amount that I do water that plant. So it's just a little uh, hint there on, on evaluating whether you're hydrating, but be sure you're removing the suckers. Now, when you're pruning later into the summer, you can be a risk to take off too much so don't, uh, don't pull off uh, and remove a lot of leaves, especially if they're just above the fruit or you're gonna end up with a tomato that got sunburned. Uh, that's what's called sun scald and it's pretty well ruined that tomato. You might be able to cut a little bit on the other side, but if you can avoid heavy pruning in the late, mid to late summer and just look at trying to manage the plant for size and stability, then that's best. Topping, here's a picture of topping it when it reaches the top of the support. And remember when you, when you uh, prune, especially early in the season, be sure to continue to fertilize. So here's a way to kind of calendarize this, um, the schedule. One to two weeks after you put it in the ground, prune off anything that's touching the ground. Remember that's gonna bring up disease. Two to four weeks after transplanting, then uh, that's when the flowers you'll probably see, uh, then remove small suckers and leaves below the first flower cluster. Six to eight weeks after transplanting, remove branches that are growing outside the cage and that'll probably have happened by then. Then four to weeks before you think it might frost and that's always a guess, isn't it? But to start topping the plant, uh, the indeterminate ones because you want it to start thinking about ripening. And then days, if, if you find it's, uh, you're getting some frost, you might wanna consider removing uh, the green fruit and ripening it indoors. Either that or you wanna cover your plant to protect it from the frost. Let's talk about pollination. The interesting thing about tomatoes is they're self-pollinating, means it's, it's a perfect flower. It has both the male and the female in the very same flower. So it doesn't really require a bee to come and travel from blossom to blossom, but all it takes is uh, the, the uh, uh, plant to have just a little bit of jarring either with the wind or whatever to uh, let that uh, pollen float down to the female part of the flower. Um, it'll, people sometimes say, why, why aren't they being pollinated? And that sometimes happens if we're having ex uh, extremes in the temperature, too cold or too warm. Those are kind of ballpark temperatures when it gets either below or above that, it may slow down pollination. Sometimes the humidity can play a part in the preventing pollination. Too humid and the pollen can't uh, float down or too dry and it doesn't stick. So we do see challenges of pollination. But here's something to think about is you can be the one that assisting with pollination. Uh, you can just go by and give a little, each flower a little shake. This, this uh, gardener uh, must not have too many plants because he's got a paintbrush out doing each one. And for me, I just go by and and bump the cage. <laughs> but it, it, you just want to try to release the pollen and you can just do it with a little bit of motion. Sometimes the wind is enough. But again, tomatoes are self-pollinating. Now, sometimes we get blossom end drop and that's discouraging. Again, the temperature plays a part. Too cold, too hot, it'll cause them to drop or a lot of wind. There's really nothing we can do about these environmental challenges, except to realize that the trader will probably, if that happened, will, as soon as the, the uh, situation and the environment is friendlier, will produce another batch of, of blossoms. So uh, not to worry too much if that happens, there's nothing you can do, but here's something you can control. And that is perhaps you've given it too much nitrogen or it's too little or too much water. You're not being consistent in your water. Uh, watering plan. Uh, there are also a few diseases that can cause that and we'll uh, not spend too much time on that, but, um, and I haven't seen those in my garden at all. Uh, 
But again, you can't control this, but you certainly can this. So be aware of that. Then I've had people say, oh, I can't grow tomatoes because all I get is a plant. I don't get any blossoms. Why doesn't the, my plant blossom? Look at this nice green thing with no blossoms. Well, there are some diseases and pests that could prevent it. But I would say most of the problem is feeding your plant too much nitrogen. Could be that there's a lot of heat that's and it's just grown it uh, so that's not going to or a lack of sunlight. But also be aware that if you plant several different types of tomatoes in your garden, they vary at during the times that they will flower. And so you don't have to get worried and say, well, my beefsteak hasn't flowered, flowered, but I have tons on my cherry. That is because of that type of tomato, the beefsteak might be doing it later. So that can also not, not to worry about that. Well, here's something we can't do anything about, and that is the weather challenges. Uh, last year, we had a heat dome here that was amazing, and uh, it makes a real challenge to try and have a garden and grow plants. Um, fortunately, the tomato is a fairly much of a tropical plant, so if you can keep it from getting too stressed, it survives. One of the things you can do is mulch heavily around the plant so you're not going to lose a lot of evaporation from the soil. You might need to water a little more or a little more deeply. And I have done uh, shade plants over my tomatoes to just keep them from getting too hot. Uh, so some solutions with a heat wave. You might see uh, plants with drought, drought stress. Uh, I think it's especially those plants are grown in pots are more vulnerable because it's hard to keep enough moisture in them when it's really hot. But that's what a drought stress plant looks like. Now, sometimes we go the other way and it just turns a, a really chilly time. Well, in the last session, I talked a lot about cloches or row covers. And here's just one picture from uh, a very an involved and fancy way to, to almost create a little greenhouse for his tomato. And there's slits in there to let the air in and uh, so that it doesn't get a lot of condensation. And the person can reach in and agitate the blossoms, help with pollination. So with nighttime chills, you need to kind of look and say, does this plant need a little bit of my protection? Well, let's talk about problems you're gonna see with some of your tomatoes. Um, three sources of tomato problems are disease, pests, and growing conditions. Now, if you, to understand disease, there are three things needed for, this is a, like a Venn diagram where we see you have a host plant, and a pathogen and the environment. And when they all come together with the elements that prevent, that start to create, you get a disease. So we wanna to try to manage the disease triangle. So here's the first factor is the host plant. In this case, it's the tomato plant. Then we have a pathogen that somehow is gonna get introduced. And then we have an environment that's not suitable, as you can see, you wouldn't grow much of anything in that uh, poorly drained uh, wet soil. So those three things together are going to cause a problem. If I can manage all three of them, I can control the disease. So how do we start with the host plant? Well, first thing I can do is try and find a tomato that's resistant to disease. And if I started from seed, I could look at the back of the packet and see that this uh, better boy hybrid is resistant to several of the uh, diseases and uh, uh, funguses and wilts that are can attach, uh, attack a uh, tomato. So check that. You might be able to check if you bought the seedling from a, a uh, nursery too to see if it's uh, the tag indicates that it has some resistance. And in order to uh, get the pathogens uh, diminished, you want to be sure and say, well, I. I don't want to stress my plant. A pathogen can easily move in if a plant is stressed. One of the ways we stress our plants is planting them at the wrong time or where it's maybe not the best weather or best temperature. This is an interesting chart um, that shows for those of you who are in Eastern or Central Oregon, uh, I know you have your challenges and you can see that uh, this was a safe time to start putting the plant in. And if you put it in in April or 1st of May, you are risking uh, the environment uh, causing stress on your plant. So uh, it's just, you, you should look at uh, where you live at the climate center uh, predictions for frost and see if you can avoid uh, planting your plant. Those of you who've planted your plants already and it's been cool, 
uh, you want to watch it because it may be a little bit uh, vulnerable to some uh, pathogens and stress because it's not the it wasn't turned out this year to not be the optimal time. Another way to um, manage pathogens is to try to plant your plants each year in a different place. That means rotate your plants. Um, they build up a uh, an environment where uh, soil-borne diseases and pests can re-establish uh, themselves every year if the same thing is planted there. So you rotate your plants. It prevents uh, soil depletion and maintains soil structure. And most important, it prevents soil-borne pests from getting a foothold in your garden. And this is not easy to do for those who have a small garden, but if you can avoid at least this family in the same spot year after year. So don't plant your tomatoes this year where you had your potatoes last year. These four, the nightshade family, uh, need to be moved around. Now, if your space is limited, you can plant in pots or you can take some of the soil away that's right there and replace it with some new uncontaminated soil. Or you can use some grafted tomatoes since those are generally resistant to soil-borne diseases. Well, so then the environment. How do you manage the environment? Well, try to plant in compost rich soil that's well drained with adequate moisture. That's beautiful looking soil there. And you wanna keep the garden clean. Remove all debris from the garden area at the end of the season and rotate your plants. This is gonna cause a problem if that just lays there all winter. Now let's talk a little bit about um, things that you might see in your tomatoes when you're going to harvest. Um, and some of these are uh, just abnormalities or they don't look like the grocery store tomato. Some of them are real problems and will prevent you from even eating the tomato. But this is just one where the green shoulders, uh, I sometimes see that it's high temperatures. Uh, maybe I've pruned a little bit too much above that plant and it's allowed it to get too hot. Uh, I just cut around it, still, still quite a good tomato. However, this is not a tomato we can ever use. And this is the dreaded blossom end rot, which we hear a lot of people asking about it. So if you say, what causes it? Well, first of all, it's caused by a calcium, calcium deficiency. But the reason it didn't get the calcium, well, it could be too, you don't have enough in the soil, but it could be that you didn't water consistently enough to bring the calcium up into the plant. Uh, and so this leathery bottom, which makes the, the fruit just un, unusable. Um, so if you want to try to avoid that, try to make sure that you've got, and that's the bone meal that you're gonna add, will we'll give you some calcium um, and you're watering consistently. Again, you need that calcium, you can put all the lime or bone meal in the soil. And if you're not getting it through water to come up into the plant, it'll not work. And you might look at uh, some varieties. Uh, some are actually listed as resistant to blossom end. And I have found that the aromas that I grow are, seem more susceptible to, um, to the blossom end rot. Uh, one year we had a late blight that flew and that's an airborne problem. And it caused, it's a, it's a fungus and it will come in from other fields or other gardens. And there's not much you can do at that point for that. I uh, haven't seen it for several years, but I do think keeping your garden clean and well organized would help. This is a, another just an abnormality in the fruit um, caused by a little abnormal uh, pollination or chilly temperatures, perhaps some herbicide exposure. Um, this is what happens when we have uneven moisture levels. You get cracking in the fruit. Again, that's a, a tomato that you can eat, but you'd like to not have that. Try to keep your moisture levels even and consistent. Uh, we talked about the sunburn or the sun scald. Um, now you'll see problems not only with the fruit, but with the leaves. And this is, uh, you'll see wilting leaves here uh, can be caused by bacterial and fungal diseases. Uh, you might see some discoloration in the leaves and this is caused by a nutritional def deficiency. In this particular case, this is magnesium deficiency. Uh, there's a lot of pictures of leaves that you can see with different patterns of yellow or discoloration. And they're generally can be indicate 
a different type of nutritional deficiency. So uh, yellowing leaves, you can look at and say, what can I do about this? In this case, because uh, it's a magnesium deficiency, I got a foliar spray uh, of, of magnesium sulfate and uh, the problem began to slowly uh, resolve, resolve. But uh, do watch the leaves for um, discoloration. This is a sad case. Uh, we had this happen when uh, we had some neighbors who had sprayed 2,4-D and then the wind picked up and uh, was hot and atomized it, vaporized it in our plants. So this is distortion caused by herbicide, specifically 2,4-D. Uh, both tomatoes and grapes are very susceptible to that particular herbicide if it's in the air and lands on the leaves. Now, you may go out and say, oh no, look, something's wrong with my tomato plant. Look at those curled leaves. Well, if you see that at the end of the day, it's just that the plant is trying to save itself from losing any more transpiration or loss of moisture through the leaf. So it just curls up and uh, in the morning you go out and it might look just fine again. So uh, it's kind of a physiological response to uh, excessive heat or low hydration. Sometimes a disease can cause that, but the most of the time when you see curled leaves, um, it's because of low hydration or wind exposure. It's just the plant's way to kind of protect itself. And some varieties actually have leaves that seem to roll a little bit more than others. Well, this is a, a bacterial disease. You see spots on the leaves or holes. We're being eaten by insects and pests. Now, I talked about, do you want a tomato that looks like perfect tomato? No, these are not perfect tomatoes, but they're not diseased. This is a perfectly fine tomato. It's called a blossom scar. And some of the heirloom tomatoes will develop this. And uh, it's just, just part of being a good heirloom tomato. Sometimes you say, oh, I'm getting yellow leaves. What's the matter? Well, there's several things that could cause it. Uh, again, a watering problem, too much or not enough. Uh, maybe the soil is too compact to get nutrients up. It could be you do have a virus, fungus, or bacteria, or lack of sun that you can see that the leaves that are hidden now toward the bottom of the plant by the other uh, leaves aren't getting the sun, and so they're not uh, be able to stay green. But I would say a good portion of the time, it's a normal stage of the growth cycle. And your leaves, especially toward the bottom, start to, to turn yellow. And you can see lovely tomatoes here, and yet you've got yellowing leaves uh, toward the bottom. So kind of uh, don't panic when you see yellow leaves, especially toward the bottom as the season progresses. If you saw it early in the year, that would be a, something to be concerned about. But toward the season, as it grows uh, along, you will see some yellowing leaves. So the thing I want to stress is you've seen some tomatoes that didn't look so good. Some were terrible. Some were just a little different. The thing is, before you do anything, you need to get identification before you do anything to a solution. And so I'm urging you to contact Master Gardeners. They can help identify and recommend what to do. And this is a site you want to go to. It's on your resources at the end. Uh, it's good if you take pictures, uh, sometimes over the phone, it's pretty hard to diagnose. You take pictures and send them in or take the plant in. We also have phone clinics now that are active and there's three in the metro area. And if you don't live in the metro area, have access to those numbers, then I suggest that you go ahead and check up on your extension service in your area because it's important before you do anything uh, that you get a real diagnosis uh, to see whether you need to do anything and if so, what. Again, contact the master gardeners. Well, some of the last problems we're gonna talk about are insects. Um, and I don't usually have problems with insects, but I do know some people do. But again, most important thing is avoid an all purpose insecticide. Anything you're gonna to do to try and get everything is gonna harm beneficial insects that are there to protect your plants. Uh, best thing to do is just get out there and watch. Uh, I've heard the old statement that the best the best garden tool is the shadow of the gardener, meaning that you're out there looking and watching and observing. So you can catch problems when they're, when they're just barely beginning. This is a plethora of aphids that should have been seen when they were just one or two. Keep 
branches off the ground. That's one of the main reasons you can get insects up into your plants. And also plant some diverse fauna around it that'll attract beneficial insects that will protect your plants. Uh, the daisy-like flowers are good ones to have. Steps to take to prevent problems. Plant healthy, disease-free plants. Start with something that looks really good, healthy. Stake it, get good air circulation. Water at the base of the plant, remember overhead watering spreads disease. And water in the morning or midday to minimize the amount of time the plant would be wet. And monitor your plants often to check for pests. Avoid working on your plants when the leaves or fruit are wet. Not a good thing, easy can spread diseases. Remove and destroy affected plants at the end of the season, clean up the garden and rotate your crops every year as, as much as possible. Now let's assume we're getting to the end of the season. We've survived all of the watering and pruning and fertilizing protocol. And we now have wonderful tomatoes, but are they gonna get ripe in time? Well, the thing to remember is that tomatoes need warmth and not light to, to ripen. So uh, it's, it's the temperature that's gonna get them ripe. Optimal temperature is this. I know it often is warmer than that. Sometimes if it's cooler, it'll certainly slow ripening. I've noticed when the temperature at night goes below 50, I don't see much ripening happening. But during the daytime, uh, you, you want some nice warmth on those tomatoes. Now, let's see if we can speed it up a little bit. I stop watering my tomatoes the first week, end of the first week of August. And I know there are people saying, but my plants are gonna, if I do that, my plants look really stressed. Yes, they do, because they are getting a little stressed and they're gonna start producing some ripe tomatoes. So reduce, if it's too hard to quit, and you live in an area where it's really hot, at least reduce the watering and the fertilizing, especially nitrogen. Now, one thing to remember is, if you're gonna water your plant and then hope to go out and pick a nice tasty tomato, you have just diluted the flavor. Watering just before picking dilutes the flavor of the tomato because the water goes right up into the tomato. And uh, it's amazing the difference in flavor. The longer I go without watering, the juicier and sweeter and more and stronger the flavor of that wonderful tomato is. So hasten ripening by removing flower clusters. They're not gonna, they're not gonna get any tomatoes mid-August. You're not gonna have tomatoes most likely and maybe even some of the really small fruit, or if there's too much, just, just so the plant can do it and remove some leaves and suckers. So in order to do this, reduce the watering and fertilizing, remove anything you don't think is gonna become a tomato by the uh, middle of August. If it's not, if it's not a, anything more than a flower or a small plant, take it off. Well, that concludes uh, the presentation. I hope that you'll be able to enjoy your tomatoes uh, and uh, feel success. You're going to see uh, at the end of my program and also I think in the chat are the resources that you can access, um, the publications from Oregon State University and the Master Gardener handouts and videos. Uh, there are many there. These are just a handful of them. And then the particular uh, sources that I used uh, in preparing. So uh, again, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and uh, wish you the best of luck. And I'm going to now invite Sherry to come and help me with um, answering some questions. Sherry, are you there? I am here. Welcome. And we had a couple real interesting questions occur. Let me get the lighting a little better there. Um, one question was, what companion plants can you put around tomatoes? Okay, my session uh, I did before was uh, uh, companion plants. There's no real uh, scientific evidence about it, about com quote companion plants. So we call them partner plants, but there are plants that will bring in beneficial insects. Uh, basil is a wonderful one because the odor seems to drive away uh, a lot of insects that would love to have on your, on your tomato. So I would encourage you to go to my previous uh, webinar because I did an extensive look into that and talk about plants that uh, you can use to enhance or uh, the one slide I showed uh, showed those planting the flowers that had the uh, 
daisy-like structures, daisy-like blossoms that bring in some in beneficial. Basically, you think of companion plants as uh, bringing in beneficials or reducing the risk of disease. And my other webinar goes into that extensively. Great, that's, that's a good response. Another question that we had, it was in regard to somebody who uh, used too much nitrogen and really over fertilized and now needs to know what do I do now? Oh, it's not too late to stop, heavens. They probably just have a nice good start in the garden. It's early <laughs> in the season, so they're okay, not to worry. At this point, the next fertilizing you do, you can move to the one, two, one, or the high phosphorus, not to panic. It's early in the season and, and the growth of the nitrogen is fine for it. Uh, I noticed that uh, Sean just put in the chat the, X, the link to my uh, previous webinar. So uh, maybe Sean, if you wanna do that again uh, and leave it up for a little minute. That's, uh, I would, I'd recommend that, but thank you, Sean. Anyway, that's uh, not to worry, not too, not, too, not too early. You know, we can make a lot of changes and mistakes and whatever in uh, growing our tomatoes, but we can usually rectify it by staking it up a little more, feeding it a little bit more, whatever. Thank you, Sean. Another question, Sherry? Um, let's see, one person re recommends rock phosphate for root development. Have you ever heard of that, Amelia? I haven't. No, it's usually the potassium that's for root development. Um, and I rock phosphate, I don't know if rock is that's rocks, if that if it's a stones or small pebbles or what, or just ground up. But uh, phos but pho certainly phosphate, phosphorus, uh, is for the uh, uh, flower development, not root. I'd never heard that. Uh, I do know that it's, it's usually potassium for the root development. But we can uh, look into that a little further. Okay, yes, I've not heard of using that. And uh, that's ahead. pretty much the end of our questions here. The thing is we would be looking for um, some science backing it up before we say yes or no on it. And I haven't seen anything on that either. You know, that's I, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, because tomatoes are so popular and susceptible to a lot of problems, there's you out there, there are so many myths, folklore, uh, whatever that says, oh, do this and do that. And I did that. And we as master gardeners uh, teach only that which is evidence-based. That's again, why the con quote companion planting, uh, there's not a lot of research on that because there's too many factors involved to really test what a good companion to our tomato is. There's too many other things, factors that impact that growing in the tomato. So uh, be careful with, um, with myths and folklore and uh, rumors and uh, over the fence suggestions and try to do some good research so that you can uh, make sure you're, you're doing what's right. A new question showed up here. Is fish fertilizer okay? Sure, yeah. It's fish an organic. Fertilizer. Pardon me? You know, it's an organic. So. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's a good, it's a good fertilizer. I, I don't know that it gives you the ratio of all three. Uh, I think I it's don't mostly, believe it does. <laughs> no, and so, so you're looking at it probably for some nitrogen, uh, but I don't know that. But anyway, you need to read the container. Yes. I know fish fertilizer, I use a lot in other places in my garden. I don't know that if it gives you the phosphorus that you want. Yes. Okay. And um, is planting in grow bags okay now? And should I mulch and fertilize my miracle Grow potting mix? Right. I, I, I think what I'm noticing is more and more of the potting mixes already have fertilizer in them. So I would say be extremely cautious there. And as far as mulching, you've got a lot of mulch material that you can use. Um, and if you're doing them in grow bags, it might slow down the weeds, but if they're in grow bags, it's pretty easy to go ahead and just pull up the few weeds that are gonna get in there. Right, I've, we've done grow bags. Um... And they're a good way to uh, have a nice big tomato when it wouldn't survive in a smaller pot. So it's, it's good. Um, okay. I would say that, um, uh, you know, I would say that 
you're using um, I, the word miracle Grow. I think is basically high nitrogen. I don't know if they have one that has a, a ratio that uh, OSU recommends of one to two to one. Um, so I'd be careful there, but you certainly can use a grow bag very successfully. Did that, did, did you think we addressed that one, Jerry? Okay. I think that one's pretty good. Uh, let's see. Uh, other than that, I don't see any others here. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to add? Um, oh, here's a question just showed up. How about planting a banana peel near the roots? I don't believe there's going to be any scientific um, research done on that. So I would say skip it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, we can't comment about that again. It's not evidence-based research. Um, if <laughs> you just have to decide out for yourself where you're getting your information from and what, and what does the banana peel add? I don't know. I guess bananas have potassium. Thinking, Maybe that's it. <laughs> potassium, I would think. Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, what about using eggshells that you have crushed, made bioavailable and doing that at planting? Well, that's the calcium. And that's again, calcium. That, yeah, uh, I, I've heard of many people doing that. So, and so that one looks to me like it's a, a pretty good question. And yes, you can. However, I will say if you're doing the crushing of your eggshells in a blender, wear a mask because that fine dust will go right in your nose when you take the lid off because it poofs up. Yes, I have done this. Sounds before. like you've done it, Sherry. <laughs> yes, experience. <laughs> okay. And there was one more question here about space requirements uh -huh. on the tomatoes. And they have limited space. Perhaps they'll need to really invest in good supports for one right. thing. That's where they could go to a single stem and really yeah. tie it up and have it grow. Or they could espalier against a fence. Um, so I think you can train, you could train a tomato to not take up much space if you really are good about staking it and pruning it. I think you could do that. It's worth trying. Sounds good. Yeah. The other thing is probably when you mentioned in pruning, don't let the tomato plant grow beyond the cage if they're putting a cage on them. Right. Right. Mine will reach over and reach the other one, even though I've got them six feet apart. I, I mean, know. I know. <laughs> and it's hard away, to turn your back. It's hard to uh, cut those branches off because you might see flowers on them. You might even see a little tomatoes, but they've got to go in order to keep that plant organized and out of so that you can get through the garden. Okay, here's another one. This is pretty good. If I planted my tomatoes too early, will they grow out of it or does that do permanent damage? Oh, well, unless they develop a disease, what's happened when you put them in early is they're just kind of sitting there saying, I'm going to wait for the sun and the I'm water. dormant. So, yeah, they're just stunted. They're just stunted, but they uh, watch them. They should be okay. And I have planted some too early and some later. And the ones later on will do well. The ones early will take a little slower to get going, but they'll be all right. Just watch them. Okay. And then we had one other one here and it says, how does ground watering differ from, uh, from container plants? I think as long as you're keeping the watering close to the soil, it's not going to matter whether you've got them in a container. What's going to matter is that you become Mother Earth when the plant is in the container and you've right. got to watch the watering. Yes, I think uh, it, that's the biggest challenge for container gardening, I think, is uh, hydration. because yeah. Hydration and nutrition, because you've got, uh, you don't have the, the wealth of the soil where the, right, the roots can spread out and bring in more nutrients. So you're going to have to fertilize very diligently and water very consistently and carefully. That's a good question. Okay. Are we about there? I think that's it. I've got one here to type in and um, that's it. All right. Well, enjoy everybody, your garden and tomatoes, and uh, may you have a successful harvest. Happy gardening. <laughs>